I would like to review an in-depth overview of a King Airway device. This is the King Airway device. This is the device I'm going to review and I would like to outline uh, everything that you need to know about this device. Before we get started, I would like to review New York City WEMAC criteria for employing this device and what the general procedures uh, state for this device is that in non-cardiac arrest situations, you are not allowed to employ this device. Thus, the only time you can employ, employ a supraglottic device, such as this one, would be in cardiac arrest situations. Now, uh, in cardiac arrest situations, New York City Remax says uh, there's no preference for either this device or endotracheal intubation. However, after uh, two failed attempts of endotracheal intubation, uh, you must then proceed to a rescue airway device, which King Airway uh, may be if your agency elected to use this device. Uh, this is just important criteria for you to know. Now, there's uh, two different varieties that King Airway comes in. There's a King LTD, and what LTD stands for is laryngeal tube disposable, and there's no suction port. The other variety is LTSD, and what S stands for is for suction or a secondary lumen, and it may accommodate up to 18 French uh, a gastric tube in order to decompress the stomach contents. Now, I'm holding uh, both varieties in my hand. In my right hand, I have King LTD. There's no suction port here, and here I have the LTSD with the suction port shown here. Another important criteria to outline, LT, LTD without the suction port, there's no opening uh, that will go inside the uh, gastrum, right? However, LTSD has an opening to accommodate the gastric tube to go to the stomach. Uh, this is just some of the important features of these two uh, devices, right? They may look similar, but they have uh, little different uh, purposes. The next thing I'd like to review is uh, distal cuffs here. Now, uh, I have a model that I want to show you guys. And what you will see is uh, this is the model of the upper airway. You have your trachea, right, which subdivides into the left and the right main stem bronchus, and you have the esophagus in the posterior portion. This device is specifically inserted to be sitting in the esophagus, and ideally you want to put it uh, uh, deep down so the connector is at the uh, tip of the teeth. I'm going to put it all the way in, right? And here I have that the connector is right away at the teeth, and you notice that the distal cuff sits right at the esophagus. When I inflate these cuffs, right, with the syringe provided here, and I inflate both of the, these cuffs, what you will see is that the distal end sits at the proximal esophagus, and the proximal add since it's the oral pharynx. And what this will do is when these cuffs are inflated, show you in a second. When these cuffs are inflated, the distal cuff that sits in the upper esophagus and the proximal cuff that sits in the oral pharynx, they will isolate uh, the laryngeal inlet, thus not allowing the passage of air distally to the stomach and not allowing air to escape through the mouth. Here you see there's openings in this tube where oxygen will flow to facilitate uh, oxygenation and also ventilation. The next thing I like to talk about uh, is sizing. So the sizing for these devices is based on uh, patient's height. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, a taller person uh, from the teeth to the laryngeal uh, inlet is much longer uh, than as opposed to somebody who is very short. Uh, that's why this is sized on person's height. Thus, you will see that uh, a yellow tip is for someone four to five feet tall, a red tip is for five to six feet tall, and greater than six feet, we're gonna utilize the purple tip. Um, uh, and also, you notice that um, in this airway device, if I were to employ uh, elastic gun bougie and I were to put it through the ventilatory lumen when it comes out through the ventilatory lumen it deflects the tip to go to the trachea thus if you see in this model 
right? If this sits in the esophagus and this deflects this anterior sleeve to the trachea, you could see that this device may be used as an endotracheal tube exchanger to replace this rescue airway for your endotracheal tube. However, I would like to caution you to avoid doing this blindly because the most important thing we need to remember is whenever we intubate somebody, we must see the endotracheal tube pass the vocal cords. Thus, I would caution against using this as a blind technique. And in a subsequent uh, video, when we show you the demonstration of this, we'll show you a appropriate technique if you elected to uh, replace this with another tracheal tube. However, keep one thing in mind, if you put this device and you have good chest rise, you're able to ventilate, oxygenate, you essentially have some time, so it's not as emergent to place an endotracheal tube, thus um, transfer the patient to a definitive care, and when they have more hands, let them uh, place uh, endotracheal tube. Uh, the final thing I'd like to talk to you about is in terms of testing and lubrication. Uh, prior to insertion, you're gonna take the syringe that's coming uh, in that bag, you're gonna take it out and this fills up up to 60. You're gonna put full 60 mLs of air to the, uh, inflate these cuffs. Now you notice here, it gives you a range between 60 and 80 and that range is because uh, if you need to uh, pull back and you hear a leak, you may need to reinflate this cuff and we'll show you more in the video when we demonstrate the skill. Now, uh, what you're gonna do is, you're gonna take this out of the bag, you're gonna inflate your cuffs. I noticed there's no leak present, they're intact. I'm now go ahead and deflate these cuffs. You wanna deflate them fully so they do not obstruct the entrance uh, when you're putting this into the patient. You're gonna employ a uh, water-soluble lubricant, right? So we're gonna lubricate this now, uh, and we're going to employ the lubricated device once we're gonna insert it in our uh, airway trainer. Uh, now, final thing just I wanna say, the way manufacturer advises to use this device, they say that uh, you're gonna perform a tongue jaw lift to the ceiling, or you could use a, a blade to facilitate that yeah, if, you don't, if you're worried about uh, patients biting on your uh, fingers. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're gonna insert this device all the way down until, until the connector is aligned with the teeth. So let me go. All right, once the connectors aligned with the teeth, you're gonna go ahead and inflate your cuffs. And what you're going to do is going to ventilate and you're gonna observe for chest rise and also monitor your entitled CO2. If you see no chest rise, what the manufacturer says is you wanna pull back and ventilate. By pulling back, you're now aligning the opening in the tube with the laryngeal inlet, facilitating the gas flow. And the reason for that is as follows. Somebody who is very tall, from the teeth to the laryngeal inlet, as I said, it's much bigger space. Thus, if you uh, didn't account properly and you had a patient who wasn't as tall, he was shorter, and you inflated it and you get poor uh, chest expansion, you would essentially pull this device back to facilitate uh, air entry. Uh, and you do not want to do it the other way around. You do not want to inflate these cuffs and then start jamming it into the patient. Thus, the proper procedure is put it all the way down, that the, the connector is at the base of the teeth, inflate, ventilate, see the chest rise, no chest rise, pull it back until you see chest rise. All right. And now I'm gonna show you the whole scenario.